What is the best evidence on the existence of God? One thing is sure, prior to the beginning, physical reality did not exist. Therefore, something else, something completely transcendent with the creative power to create out of nothing would have had to have done it. What is the evidence for Jesus Christ being God? Boy, it's it's a huge amount of things. In the Old Testament, the flood. Is this an allegory? Was there a a flood. There was a flood. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Thanks so much to everyone who has been asking me how I'm doing because my voice has been maybe a little hard to listen to in some recent episodes. I had a horrible cough and got sick over the last month, but I am back at it and thankfully feeling much better. Today, we've got a really special guest in studio. I'm very excited about today's episode. We're going to be sitting down. We are sitting down with the only, the one and only Father Robert Spitzer of the Magus Center. He was also the president of Gonzaga University. He is a very good Jesuit priest, one of the the cream of the crop, uh, has been a priest for over 40 years, but really has done incredible writing and speaking on the origins of the universe, the, the existence of God, those mega questions about life and humanity. And we're going to get into that on today's podcast. I think it's fitting. It's the end of the year. We're going to be going into 2024. We just celebrated Christmas. Merry Christmas, by the way. (laughs) Sorry for not already saying that. Um, But we're going to talk about the big questions about how do we know that God exists, uh, proof for the existence of God, and so much more. So without further ado, Thank you so much, Father Spitzer, for joining the podcast. Oh, always great to be with you, Lila. Thanks for the opportunity. So, quick background on you for those that are not familiar. You're one of the most brilliant priests around. Um, everyone thinks so that knows your work. So, give us a little background on your educational background and on your professional work, Father. Well, um, my professional uh, background is I, uh, you know, would teach uh, in, a, in, a, in a university in the philosophy department generally. Generally, but uh, taught philosophy of science, taught also uh, metaphysics, the uh, relationship between uh, faith, science, philosophy, and science. Um, uh, throughout my uh, career, I started at Georgetown and uh, went um, uh, to Seattle University, where I took the Frank Schrantz chair uh, there, and then uh, finally went to Gonzaga University as the president uh, of the university there, uh, but continued to teach in the areas of uh, uh, philosophy of God, faith and science, um, you know, scientific evidence of God, etc. in those areas for uh, those times. And I've wrote, written it extensively on it. I just published uh, two new books. Um, one's called uh, Science at the Doorstep to God, um, and the other is Science, Reason, and Faith, Discovering the Bible. And I have another one coming out um, called Science at the Doorstep to Christ, uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, the Shroud of Turin, Eucharistic Miracles, the scientific investigation of those things. So um, uh, I've been uh, hard at this uh, subject <laughs> for uh, for many, many years. I've been a priest for 40 years, as you said, but um, uh, also I've been in the academic area um, for uh, even longer time, about 45 years uh, I've been doing this. Wonderful. And the institute that you lead now, what does the institute do? Well, the Majus Center um, certainly, of course, uh, sponsors the books. Uh, we do want to get out to that uh audience that is uh, can benefit from a book, wants the deeper explanation, and so forth. And the reason we write it is because the Catholic Church has been the leader in faith and science and faith and reason, well, throughout its existence, basically. Um, we have uh, certainly not shunned science. Uh, you know, you know, several priests were at the forefront of science, uh, science and including uh, Father Georges Lemaitre, who was the uh, first person to discover the big Bang Theory, where he crafted basically Einstein's general relativity theory into a theory mm-hmm. of uh, initial origins of the universe, which um, at first Einstein told him, well, the mathematics is fine, the physics it just can't be, you know, it can't have an expanding universe. And later on, after uh, Hubble actually uh, showed through his survey of the heavens that it was true, um, 
uh, he came, Einstein came back to Lemaitre and said, well, uh, Father, um, your explanation of the universe is one of the very best I've ever seen. Wow. So he came back around. So um, in any case, but the Catholic Church has been in that, uh, in that area for a long, long time. So the books are really important. Um, that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, for us a kind of a foundation stone to keep the, the Catholic Church current uh, in those scientific areas and the philosophical areas. Uh, then we also make high school and middle school curricula. So uh, if I might uh, brag, um, there is a very good uh, book called uh, uh, series um, called The Catholic Faith and Science. Uh, one of is a is a one semester course for middle school called Speak the Faith. The other one um, is a one semester course for senior year of high school called The Catholic Faith and Science. Our partner is Sophia Institute for Teachers. Uh, with that uh, course, I recommend it for anybody. If you want to form a, a leader in, in evangelization um, uh, these days, science does the talking for young people. Mm -hmm. uh, no question about that. And if we don't let science do some talking uh, to show the evidence uh, for God from the science, um, I'm afraid uh, we're going to lose 42% of our kids, uh, which is what the Pew survey uh, is showing uh, very recently. But we also do many other things at Modges. We also um, you know, run uh, um, a series of uh, on our own uh, uh, website. Uh, uh, we have a series of resources uh, there as well. Uh, we also have a parish program uh, that we work um, again with uh, Sophia Institute for uh, for Teachers. They uh, publish our books, and you know, I do the videos and things that can be self facilitated. And then we work with youth groups uh, as well. We're uh, starting to put together a deal with Life Teen right now, and. And uh, we're also working with seminarians because the propedeutic year for the seminary, that's the time to really get the scientific training and background undergirding our faith, which will help young people out. But it'll also help the seminarians out mm -hmm. as well. So we kind of diversify into all those areas, but uh, they're all very needed in our culture today. GoodRanchers.com is American Meat Delivered. It is America's number one meat poultry, seafood, and pork company. This is all 100% sourced in the United States of America, and the quality is amazing. One of the best steaks I've ever had was from a Good Ranchers box that I received. My husband and I have their chicken and their steak, and we've been eating it regularly. We love it. The quality is like nothing that you can find in the grocery store. At GoodRanchers.com, you can also get some great deals right now. You can get a single box of a meat and poultry mix, or you can get a subscription and some amazing discounts on your meat subscription so that you get every month your meat and poultry or your seafood and pork to your home. 100% guarantee satisfaction, free shipping, fast shipping. So go to GoodRanchers.com today. You can check it out. Get 15% off your order. You can use the code Lila at checkout for that extra percentage off. And know that when you order from Good Ranchers, you are ordering from American Ranchers. You know where your meat is coming from. It's the highest of quality meat and you're going to love it. Check it out today. That's GoodRanchers.com. Wonderful. Well, earlier you were saying something really interesting. I want to start with it because mm -hmm. I think this is the common objection to, uh, let's say, religious faith or the concern about faith in general mm -hmm. is that it somehow contradicts science and reason. And I think particularly with the Roman Catholic Church, I think there is a, a common misunderstanding that the church has somehow been uh, regressive. Mm -hmm. uh, has rejected the advances of science or has persecuted, you know, persecuted Galileo, mm -hmm. persecuted those that were uh, seeing advancements in that space. So what's, you mentioned a priest who mm -hmm. uh, is really actually schooled Einstein as mm -hmm. an example, but give us more your take on the church's engagement and development of the sciences over the last several centuries. Sure. Well, uh, just, um, you know, to start off with, uh, it used to be the case that, you know, there was more or less an even split uh, between um, scientists who were theists, uh, believers in God, versus scientists who are agnostics and atheists. Today, however, 51% of scientists overall um, declare, according to the last Pew survey, um, declare themselves to be believers in God or a high transcendent power. Only 21% uh, declare themselves to be agnostic and 20% uh, declare themselves to be atheists. So the idea that most scientists are atheists is just simply false. What's more interesting is among young scientists today, six, uh, that's 35 years or younger, 
uh, 66% of those young scientists declare themselves to be believers in God or a higher transcendent wow. power. And the reason for that is, is pretty clear because uh, the evidence is now, which we'll talk a little bit about today, uh, is overwhelming in favor of God. It's much harder to be an atheist today than ever before <laughs> in the history of both faith and science. And by the way, only about 15% of um, a young scientists declare themselves to be uh, agnostics and about 15% atheists. Uh, mm -hmm. Among medical doctors, it's really uh, uh, differentiated. 76% of doctors declare themselves to be believers in God or a higher transcendent power. Only 12.1% percent uh, declare themselves to be um, agnostics, 11.5 percent declare themselves to be atheists. And then uh, if you look at the percentage of doctors who believe in miracles, you know, 74 percent of doctors believe in miracles, uh, both past and present. And the reason is clear, uh, because they see the miracles in their own practice. Wow. I mean, I, 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 you know, doctors have told me, you know, every two months I see something that's completely naturalistically inexplicable. I mean, I, I, I can't possibly be, uh, is atheist. it connected to prayer or connected it's to the faith connect of the patient or their family? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely connected to prayer. There's very good articles by Dr. Harold Kinnick at Duke University Medical School, and he and his team have put together a series of studies that show that prayer not only has a beneficent effect uh, in emotional health, right? So uh, people's uh, well-being emotionally, but there we know there's a three to four times uh, increase in a sense of well-being, or we could look at the opposite direction. Um, those who are non-religiously affiliated have a four times increase in um, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, suicides. So we know religion and prayer are really important for emotional health. But what Koenig is showing uh, in his mm -hmm. studies is it also has a radically good effect on physical health. Wow. And um, all, all, by the way, all of his articles, as K O E. NIG. Um, all those articles are um, free of charge right on the internet. Mm -hmm. So just look up Dr. Harold uh, Koenig, Duke University uh, Studies in, in Medicine and Faith. Uh, you'll see it. So there is that mm -hmm. uh, going on. But back to the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. um, there's a wonderful little Wikipedia article called uh, Catholic Clerics in Science, or uh, maybe it's now um, Catholic Clergy um, uh, Scientists is the, the name of the wiki article, C Catholic Clergy. There they show that uh, well over 200 priests, priests, now, you know, were involved, uh, Catholic priests were involved in the development of science. I mean, uh, first of all, you know, Roger Bacon, I, I don't have to say anything more about that. Uh, he's the, a monk, a uh, Franciscan monk, but of course was the founder of a scientific methodology. Nicholas Copernicus, mm -hmm. uh, well, he was a Catholic cleric, he wasn't a priest, but he was responsible for the Copernican Revolution. Remember, Remember, the whole Galileo affair was about heliocentrism, right? The sun being at the center of the solar system and planets revolving around uh, the sun. And, and uh, um, the Catholic Church was certainly not against heliocentrism. After all, the first person to articulate mathematically and, and justify mathematically uh, the possibility of heliocentrism was a Catholic cleric named Nicholas Copernicus, who basically um, uh, even had a, a, a canon law degree as well. Uh, so, very ensconced in faith, very ensconced in Catholic Church, but of course, one of the prime, the reason he's revolution, Copernican revolution, is he was the, the guy who took the first step, um, you know, in heliocentrism. Uh, furthermore, um, I think uh, people recognize the name uh, Gregor Mendel, uh, the father of quantitative mm -hmm. genetics. Uh, he was an Augustinian monk and abbot. Uh, you take a look at Nicholas Steno. Uh, Nicholas Steno was the father of of uh, what we call a contemporary stratigraphy. Um, that's the geological evaluation of stratification mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, the Earth's core, its uh, crust, and, and so forth. So all of these things. That, he was, uh, by the way, a Catholic bishop, Danish bishop uh, there. As I just said, Father Georges Lemaitre is the father of the Big Bang Theory. Now, that's the most comprehensive, rigorously established uh, theory in, um, uh, that, you know, unifies uh, all of our cosmology and physics and astrophysics. 
Physics Today. That was a Catholic priest, and as I said, acknowledged by Einstein uh, to have been uh, the first person um, to have discovered it. And by the way, if you look at that, if you look at that article in the Wikipedia, you can see two hundred other uh, <laughs> uh, Catholic priests who are instrumental. By the way, the Catholic Church, the Jesuits specifically, uh, controlled seism- uh, seismological uh, laboratories mm-hmm. all over the world mm-hmm. for over a, a century. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to know what was going on scientifically from a geological perspective, earthquakes, et cetera, et cetera, earth movement, et cetera, uh, tectonic plate, pl- uh, uh, you just consulted a Catholic priest. Uh, they were the guys at the, at, the, at the head of the thing. So the idea that the Catholic Church is so <laughs> antithetical to science mm-hmm. is pretty laughable. I mean, they were involved in science from the very beginning. And the, the mm-hmm. Galileo affair was not uh, about heliocentrism or even uh, the church's rejection of a scientific theory. It was all about the rules of publication during that time. And basically, the Pope said to Galileo, this is very controversial. We're getting our chops busted here by a lot of people, not just the Catholic Catholic uh, faithful, but Protestant faithful as well, are very concerned about this uh, uh, thought that maybe heliocentrism contradicts the Bible. So let's back off on this until we have positive proof from stellar parallax that it is, mm-hmm. in fact, the case. You can't just leap from the lunar orbit orbits around um, uh, Jupiter, you can't leap uh, then uh, to a heliocentric view of the solar system without factual verification through stellar parallax. That's a technique that you can use to verify that uh, for sure the only explanation um, is that the the, uh, er, the planets are orbiting around the sun rather than, um, you know, the sun and the other planets orbiting around the earth. That was called geocentrism. But the, the key point is, is uh, the Pope just asked him, hold off on the publication. It was Galileo who said, I don't think I'm going to do that. I'm going to publish this as fact. And then, of course, he kind of ridicules the Pope as being a fool in his dialogue and uh, you know the pope said man you know this is this is uh, way beyond the pale here you're acting that you know like something that uh, is not a fact has established fact yet um is really the truth uh, there was a, a very fine jesuit by the name of saint uh, robert bellerman and bellerman 10 years earlier before the whole controversy i'm convinced that if bellerman had been alive um uh, the controversy would have never happened but mm. well, bellerman actually told his friend Foscarini, he said, look, you know, uh, and we now call that Bellerman's principle today. But he said, look, he said, if you can give me a scientific demonstration that, in fact, the, the earth is orbiting around the sun, then no problem. It's up to us as scripture scholars to find an interpretation of scripture that does not conflict with the scientific fact. But to my mind, such a demonstration does not exist yet. And of course, it didn't exist until Bessel came along, mm-hmm. you know, um, almost 200 years later and established through stellar parallax, um, you know, that heliocentrism was indeed the case. So, I mean, um, the, it, it, it wasn't about the Catholic Church rejecting science. Catholic Church would never have done anything like that. Uh, the Catholic Church would, uh, you know, certainly have been open to it. And Bellarmine, as he said, hey, if you can give me a scientific demonstration establishes the facticity of this, <laughs> I'm all over it. But uh, you don't have one, uh, Galileo. Then when he published that thing, then that's when the Pope got upset and said, hey, you know, you broke your promise, et cetera, et cetera. So it wasn't that it might in some way uh, endanger scripture. It was more that we want more proof and we need mm-hmm. to, you know, there was a there was a high standard that they had for mm-hmm. new theories that would be kind of expounded upon, especially in a culture where, you know, the papacy had an outsized impact both politically mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. culturally. I think people don't realize that today because mm-hmm. today's papacy – has some impact politically, but nothing close to what it did in the last, you know, few hundred years of, of Western civilization. But yeah. you mentioned something really interesting. We'll start with this when we go, because mm-hmm. we're going to get into how do we know God exists? Is there empirical evidence that God exists? And I'm going to ask that question. But first, mm-hmm. you mentioned the Big Bang Theory mm-hmm. as a theory of a Catholic priest initially. Mm-hmm. Can you explain how the, because some people see the Big Bang Theory as well, the universe came into existence not through God and, the, you know, the seven days of uh, creation in Genesis. Mm. Clearly, this denies that because it, Big Bang Theory doesn't account for seven days of Genesis, no. as it told in the book of Genesis. Can yeah. you break that down for people why the scriptural account of the creation of the universe is in no way contradicted by 
a Catholic priest theory of the Big mm-hmm. Bang. Sure. Well, first of all, you know, um, with respect to, uh, uh, you know, looking at scripture um, and um, uh, science, the first thing is we got to go back to that uh, encyclical of Pope Pius the Twelfth uh, called Divino Afflante Spiritu, and, and this came out in 1942. But Pope Pius the Twelfth, you know, of course, you know, the Big Bang theory uh, it was already published by Lemaitre in 1927. So, I mean, the word was out. The universe is, you know, now we know the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Uh, at the time, Lemaitre thought it was 18 billion years old. That's because he didn't have the good observational powers of telescopes we have today. But the point um, is that um, uh, when uh, this came out, you know, Pope Pius XII had to answer. And he made an observation that stays with us to this very day. And, the, um, and he said, look, the point of sacred scripture is to give sacred truths necessary for salvation. That's not the purpose of science. The purpose of science is to give an empirical, mathematical explanation of the physical universe. Now, um, you have to let the two, you know, methods do what they're supposed to do according to their two purposes. You don't want to make, um, you know, uh, you know, the sacred scripture, which is supposed to give us sacred truths necessary for salvation. You don't want to make the, the scriptures do science. Because that's never been the intention of God in the scriptures, and it was never the intention of the biblical author in, in you know, being inspired to write the scriptures to do an empirical mathematical explanation of the physical universe. They were trying to explain the important kinds of things uh, that are necessary for our salvation. For example, um, you know, the biblical author, we're talking here about, you know, around 600 BC to, uh, to 500 BC, right in that area, the biblical author um, uh, who's, uh, you know, writing, you know, let's say our Genesis 1 account um, in, in the Bible, and and um, uh, we call him the priestly author, whoever uh, he was, but this priestly author uh, who's writing it in about 600 uh, to 500 BC, he, he's looking at it from the vantage point of, there's all these rival myths out there, the Gilgamesh epic, right, and, mm. and uh, the At- Atrahasis, um, you know, a- epic, and so forth and so on, and they have a very different view of cosmology than me, you know, the biblical author, I'm inspired uh, to, to, to know. And uh, so what are some of the differences? So he, first of all, he, you know, it's polytheism galore in the rival epics, right? But the, the biblical author says, no, there's one and only one God. Is that necessary for salvation? Oh, yes. That's very necessary for salvation. Number two, there's, uh, you know, God is the creator of everything else that is. There's one God, everything else is a creator. So there's no sea God, there's no forest God, there's no mountain God, etc. There's just the one transcendent God, everything else, mountains, trees, seas, etc. are creatures. But then he goes on to say a lot of other important things. So, of all the rival myths, of course, human beings are mere cannon fodder, you know, on the old chessboard uh, for the gods to play with. And the biblical author says, no, that is not the case at all. Human beings are actually made in the image and likeness of God. And from the beginning, God made them because he loved them. He made us in his own image because he loved us. And, of course, this is so radically different from these rivals. Is that necessary for civilization? Oh, yeah. I mean, it sets the tone for the next 2,600 years of religious history. So this is really important. Now, did the biblical author, um, was he supposed to be inspired about science? Was he supposed to say 13.8 billion years ago, a quantum cosmological configuration came into existence and suddenly it separated off so that the gravitational power was no longer, uh, you know, in in a quantum gravitational state, but was really a space-time configuration that we know in the general theory of relativity. And then the uh, electro-weak force rolled off of the the strong nuclear force. And then, of course, uh, what happened is stellar, uh, you know, uh, nucleosynthesis and so forth and so on. I mean, the biblical author couldn't possibly understand anything of it. But here's the devil's advocate right the devil's advocate and i'm sure there's someone listening who is thinking okay uh christians consider the bible to be part of the inspired word of god 
both evangelicals and Catholics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's certainly part of the magisterium as Catholics. Mm -hmm. So it's part of, you know, this is the, mm -hmm. the, the governing body of truth for faith and morals. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the Genesis account, mm -hmm. so was that just sort of some fancy allegory he used about the garden and the seven days? Because there's certainly, especially among some Catholics and certainly among many evangelicals that say we can't just throw out the seven days because they're inconvenient with sciences, uh, the new information we have from our understanding of science. No, it's a really good question. I mean, uh, basically, we don't have the same uh, viewpoint uh, as the evangelicals do uh, relative to what we call inspiration. There's basically two opposed views of inspiration. One's the dictation theory of inspiration. The other is the co-participative um, um, uh, view of inspiration. The dictation theory is that God comes and says, okay, uh, uh, Father Spencer, you know, um, he, he, write down exactly what I'm saying. Everything I'm saying is truth. It's not just truth about salvation. Uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, truth about things necessary for salvation. It's truths about science too. You have to take it all, and all of it is meant uh, to explain, explain truth in all fields of thought. We don't have that view of inspiration. Never have had, not even at the time of St. Augustine, uh, you know, in the 400s did we ever have such a view of inspiration. We always had a co-participative view of inspiration, that God works with and through the biblical author, <clears throat> so that the biblical author is part of the inspired word. Now, of course, Cardinal Ratzinger, the mm -hmm. very important, became Pope Benedict. Uh, he wrote, wrote, has written a, a lot of important books on this. Well, how do you tell then what parts of you know, Scripture inspire, what parts are not inspired, what parts are culturally relative, what parts are the core material? So Ratzinger distinguishes between um, you know, what he calls the core uh, inspiration, and also what he calls, uh, you know, the rind. In other words, the the skin or the husk that's surrounding the core. And he just says the the, the rind or the the husk is really, he calls it the form of the expression or the external form of the expression. That, he says, is culturally relative. It's not inerrant, therefore. Whereas the core inspiration that we've been talking about, they say, there's one God, um, you know, there's no sea gods, et cetera, et cetera, or that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, et cetera. These are the core inspirations. They're inerrant. They're never going to change. But, uh, you know, Ratzinger would say, well, wait a minute, does that mean then that, uh, um, you know, the form of the expression is not always inerrant? Yes, uh, the form of the, of the expression is not always inerrant. In other words, the biblical author didn't have a scientific form of, it, of expression. You can't make him have a scientific view of expression. And in Divino Afflante Spiritu, that's what Pope Pius XII makes very clear that if you're talking merely about the external form of the expression, then, of course, it is culturally relative. So you don't have to accept that as a form of expression. So could you say a day is allegorical? Yes, you can say that a day is allegorical, of course. Um, and, of course, can you say that the garden is allegorical or even metaphorical? Yes, you can. And, by the way, most Catholic scripture scholars today uh, view the garden, per se, as metaphorical. Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, that uh, the expression, though, has a, the, the whole core, uh, of, you know, of the uh, revelation. That definitely, um, uh, you know, for example, original sin or that, you know, Adam and Eve were made uh, with a fully uh, cognizant, reflective awareness of God, of God uh, present to their consciousness. Yes, that um, uh, part is definitely core revelation is inspired um, and inerrant. How and uh, the fact that they turned around and uh, and uh, you know they understood um, that you know, various things were wrong. For example, uh, self-idolatry, they knew that. They knew they weren't gods. But of course, as the biblical text says so perfectly, mm -hmm. uh, the devil comes with what little tidbit mm -hmm. for them. If you eat from this fruit, why? 
you'll be just like God's. You'll be as smart as he is. You know, he's holding something back from you. Uh, all you got to do is eat, and you're going to be just like him. Self-idolatry to the man. Do a, yes, that's a core inspiration. You know, and they went ahead and ate the fruit. And, of course, the fall happened. Concupiscence enters into the world. That original condition of Adam and Eve is, is now ruptured. And, of course, we're stuck with it uh, to this very day in what we call being born into original sin. So I have always had a hard time finding skincare products that I really liked and wanted to continue using. I've tried a lot of different products. So I was really excited to discover NimiSkincare.com. That's Nimi, N-I-M-I, skincare.com. What's so awesome about Nimi is it's a beautiful brand that shares our values. It's a pro-life, pro-family brand. But that doesn't mean necessarily the product is going to be amazing. So I tried the product a few months ago, and I fell in love. Nimi Skincare has an amazing vitamin C cream that I love using, an evening moisturizer that I've been using, and I also really love their sunscreen. They have amazing products that are simple. The ingredients are no nonsense. They're listed on the website. You know what you're using on your skin, and the price point is great. So check out nimiskincare.com. I think you're going to really enjoy their products. That's nimiskincare.com, and you can get 15% off your order using the code Lila at checkout. Let's mm-hmm. take that for a moment. There's so much good stuff to unpack here, and we're going to get to the proof for the existence of God in, in maybe maybe towards the end after exploring okay. this piece because yeah. I think it's connected to the Big Bang Theory coexisting with the Genesis account and both being true, parts of the Genesis account potentially being allegorical, as you're saying, but there's core truths that don't change, like man and woman, he created them, in the image of God, he created them. But something I've always wondered is, you know, there's the theory of evolution, uh, of course, you know, there's um, uh, macro and micro evolution and certain aspects of it that we know are more maybe provable than others, but Mm -hmm. this idea that God created man innocent with free will and then we chose to sin Mm -hmm. and we broke you know we we brought upon the the curse of death etc right how does that fit into the scientific reality of the origin of the universe and the origin of humankind were there two initial adult human beings that dropped out of nowhere where there may be a thousand of them that God just created as adults potentially Mm -hmm. that then were given the choice whether or not they were going to obey and then disobeyed and that disobedience carried on for generations. What's your take on that? Well, um, by the way, I have a book called Science, Reason, and Faith, Discovering the Bible, put out by our Sunday Visitor Press, OSV Mm -hmm. Press. Um, I have this explained uh, in the first three sections, but let me just give you the Brief, the cliff oh, notes. The cliff <laughs> notes version. In the scientific account of evolution, uh, there's no question um, that Homo sapiens sapiens, um, you know, were you know kind of originating out of. Previous hominids. So it would be Homo erectus prior to Homo erectus. Uh, was Homo habilis prior to Homo habilis. There were a var- variety of other uh, uh, elementary hominids. Now, um, Homo sapiens come uh, about, and then Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, and that's certainly going to be the case for about 600,000 uh, years ago. But suddenly, 200,000 years ago, out of this group called Homo sapiens sapiens, we have what we call mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. Them. Who are these two? Well, they're not our first and sold ancestors, as I'll explain mm-hmm. in a moment, but they are our first mm-hmm. genetic ancestors. In other words, mitochondrial Eve is our mother, our genetic mother. Mm-hmm. Everybody on the earth, every single person on the earth has her mitochondrial DNA and embedded in every cell of our bodies. So she is present everywhere as our genetic mother, and that is uh, in every human being. Y chromosome Adam, who also lived about 200,000 years ago, he is the um, uh, the ancestor, the, the father of every man on the globe. Mm-hmm. So uh, if, if you look at the, um, the Y chromosome, that's why he's called Y chromosome Adam, uh, the Y chromosome in every man's body is you know, a a remnant of what um, we got from Y chromosome Adam 200,000 years ago. Now, I, I, you know, you ask a good question. Um, You know, well, are they our first parents? Is that uh, who Adam and Eve are referred to? I don't think so. I think they're our first genetic parents. But for 130,000 years, our, you know, the progeny of 
uh, mitochondria even white chromosome atom. They were, you know, living at the border of Namibia and Angola, uh, you know, cracking coconuts and eating bananas and being very sedate and non-creative. So these are not but, homo sapiens. Well, they are homo They sapiens. are homo sapiens. Oh, very much so. But you're saying they're not in soul yet. They, I don't think they're in soul. Wow. Uh, in fact... <laughs> I think ensoulment happened 60,000 years ago. There's a very good book that just came out about five years ago, MIT Press, by Noam Chomsky and Robert Berwick. And in that book, it's called Why Only Us. You get the the genetic evidence of uh, there's something strange going on 60,000 years ago. Anthropologically, we call it the great leap forward. I'll just give you the cliff notes again. 60,000 years ago, pro- there's no previous example of mathematics being anywhere around Homo sapiens or around the, the progeny of Y chromosome Adam and um, uh, mitochondrial Eve. None. And then all of a sudden, 60,000 years ago, we see counting sticks everywhere. And we see notch counting sticks. We see three road non, uh, um, uh, notch counting sticks where people are actually doing not just addition, but multiplication on various ba- base levels. And, and you look at that and you go, wow, well, you know, that just came out of nowhere. I'll get, you know, I'll get to the point in just a moment. Then suddenly, there's no conceptual language, uh, you know, like, for example, we have perceptual ideas versus conceptual ideas. Uh, perceptual ideas, uh, ideas where a very highly trained a chimp, like Nim Chimsky, he can learn 120 uh, words in American Sign Language. But all American Sign Language is doing is comparing the image of a banana with the symbol, uh, the, the American Sign Language symbol of a banana. That's great, but it's all on the perceptual individuated image level. Mm. Ch- Nim Chimsky has no uh, words for groups, no words for relationships among things, no um, uh, words for relationships among relationships. In other words, no abstract ideas that can serve to function for math to serve for groups of things uh, where you can talk you know talk about groups of things and make abstract comments about them and characteristics about it. you know Nim Chimsky with all of his 150 words in American sign language he can't distinguish between dog bites man and man bites dog mm-hmm. what will make a you know a 2 year old little child chortle at the thought of a man biting the dog Nim's clueless. He doesn't get it because he doesn't have any conceptual ideas. But 60,000 years ago, what do we notice? This huge advance in technology, not just in weaponry and fish hooks, but I mean, navigation technology, the creation of boats, geography. They're actually now beginning to, 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 to move 60,000 years ago from, you know, the, the border of Namibia and Angola all the way up to the northern coast of Africa. We'll talk about this in a moment. And then using navigation technology that's highly sophisticated go all the way down to India. I mean, th- suddenly, where's this coming from? A- and so we can see that there's conceptual ideas going on. Then we also notice homo religiosus, right? So it's not just homo mathematicus and, uh, you know, homo uh, uh, linguisticus, etc. that we also see this, this homo religiosus where all of a sudden, the, uh, human beings 60,000 years ago start burying their dead mm. with grave goods that could be very useful in the afterlife. <laughs> Neanderthals buried their dead, but never with a grave good. They never buried them with flints and weapons and spears, you know. And then, the, all of a sudden, these figurines of goddesses, not just fertility goddesses, mm-hmm. but lion goddesses and all kinds of other things, you know, powerful god, uh, gods and goddesses, excuse me. And so you begin to see, aha! And then we begin to see the symbolic cave uh, paintings that are going 60,000 years ago we, in the caves in Indonesia and in France, suddenly we get, you know, art of every kind. And it's not just um, art like painted jewelry, though that, it's not just music from bone flutes and, and, and mm-hmm. things like that. Oh, the, certainly that. But also, we get highly s- symbolic paintings. In other words, mm-hmm. we can see that these in, in these images that are being drawn, there's some notion of transcendence, some higher power that's already, that, that, that human 
beings are thinking along the lines of, it isn't all about just being here on earth. They have a sense of uh, immortality. They have a sense of a divinity and transcendence that goes way beyond any Neanderthal. And then it gets even more interesting. Uh, you know, it's not just the, the aesthetics and, and, and so forth, the religion, but all of a sudden we can see that the complexity of the establishments that they have. So they're now building villages and it has an order to the village. There's a center, there are peripheries, all kinds of, but it, it gets even more interesting. Suddenly, as I said, 60,000 years ago, our indolent, uh, you know, um, a progeny of um, a white chromosome Adam and, and uh, mitochondrial Eve, suddenly, kablamo, they are going 60,000 years ago right to the top of uh, of Africa. They're crossing the straits. They're going into Asia. Mm -hmm. They're settling everywhere in Asia. They're just multiplying languages as they go. And all kinds of linguistic systems and grammatical systems requiring very abstract consciousness. And then they're going over into Europe and they're zooming all the way up to the northern parts of, of uh, Europe and then crossing the Arctic land bridge. So they're moving from uh, Europe or Russia all the way to Alaska. At one time there was a land bridge. It, actually, you could walk over uh, to get uh, to the northern parts of, of what we call Alaska today, and then all the way down to the southernmost tip of uh, South America. And we did that in 10,000 years. For 130,000 years, we did nothing but eat co uh, bananas and <laughs> crack coconuts, and then suddenly we're like k kablamo. But you're, <laughs> you're saying we, and our human beings, yeah. human beings mm -hmm. but you're implying, and I'm, I'm cutting you off a little bit here, but I really want to really want to get this i know people listening are wondering yeah is that <clears throat> the the spark of god it got he created them in his image he created them male and female he created them did that happen in its fullness at that 60 uh, 60,000 years ago was that yes, the number I think mark and they got ensouled and that's when they had the ability for worship and for language and for organizing and for relationship you got it <clears throat> in other words in my view 60,000 years ago God gave a transcendent soul to the first male um, and first female um, ancestors. So he chose uh, two, two, two of these progeny, and he gave them <clears throat> a, tr a transcendent soul. What I mean by transcendent soul is the capacity to transcend mere physical processes. You see, you can't become mm -hmm. conceptual without having what we call some higher abstract notions <clears throat> that give rise to questions and things like that. You're not going to get those from physical processes and structures. We have self-consciousness, and you're not going to get that from physical processes and structures. You can show the irreducibility of human self-consciousness to physical processes and structures. You can't reduce um, them to physical processes. So in other words, something happened. We were given some kind of transcendental powers that enabled us to be mathematical, that enabled us to break what's called uh, Gettle's um, incompleteness theorems and become abstractly mathematical. Did that transcendental power include immortality that, that was then immediately lost because of sin? Well, you know, um, certainly it did include immortality because by its very nature, right, a, a um, transphysical thing like a soul doesn't have to die along with the physical body. So it definitely included, um, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a form of immortality, and of course, did um, did we lose that uh, immortality? Um, you know, because of. Um uh, the the first sin of Adam and Eve, um, there you know the the point that um, you know interpreting the word death uh, comes into the world. Uh, you could certainly say this: human beings knew uh, the minute they had an immortal soul and had this sense, this awareness of being immortal in themselves. They knew that what they had done threatened their capacity um, to uh, to live beyond the material world. And that we can surely establish is a biblical fact that corresponds with the scientific evidence. Now, um, did you say, would you say, well, did physical death come into the world at that point? No, uh, because of course there are lots of uh, organisms that died. Uh, there have been about life for about 3.9 billion years um, microorganisms for a long time, but 2 billion years, we've had plant life that's died 
died and you know we've then had you know uh, worms that died and you know you know higher and higher um, amphibians that died and then finally vertebrates that died etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's been a lot of death out there but the idea uh, you know that you who were made to be immortal now could die. In other words, your immortality has been taken away from you. You know, that very thought, of course, is going to come right into only one creature, human beings. They're going to know, wow, it could all be over here. Now, that doesn't mean that God condemned all, you know, um, uh, beings um, uh, prior to the coming of Christ uh, to die. Um, you know, uh, essentially what we hold is that they went to, and in the Old Testament, they went to the domain of Sheol, the realm of the dead. And there they were to await the coming of the Messiah and liberation uh, from death. So that certainly uh, begins to be an, a, a reality in the Old Testament, starting with Proto Isaiah, with the first Isaiah, uh, you know, um, and then uh, uh, certainly we can see it again and again and again manifest not only in the Book of Wisdom and Maccabees, etc., but we see it in various other uh, biblical texts. But the idea of original sin entering the world with mm -hmm. this choice to sin. Uh, the choice of disobedience, a lack of trust, really, of the Father, mm -hmm. of, the, of the Creator of God, by our parents, right? Mm -hmm. And that we all now have this wound. And mm -hmm. then there's the, you know, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Mary was conceived without mm -hmm. sin. And we mm -hmm. could, that's a whole other conversation we're not going to get into today yeah. necessarily. But, but I think the question here is, for our parents, that those in, first and sold homo sapiens, who are fully made in the image and likeness of God, who uh -huh. somehow, at least the first ones, didn't have original sin, the stain of it, and then they got it yeah. by their choice and by that, mm -hmm. you know, then we all got it. How yeah. does that, you know, was it just two people? Was it maybe the thousands that were on the earth and they all decided together to choose to sin? What's the theory on that? Is there a theory on that? Yeah, well, um, you know, in, in that book, Why Only Us, uh, Berwick and Chomsky believe it comes down to essentially a single um, a member or two single members who are mates uh, who committed, oh, didn't they don't say committed, th that they were uh, the ones that to receive the first soul. So it, it would be uh, two individuals uh, that were somehow, uh, uh, you know, mated together or a single individual, um, you know, uh, in the species. That's the origin of what we call today language, um, syntactically significant language, mathematics, etc. So it seems to come down to a single uh, pair of ancestors, um, and that's that's uh, MIT Press, right? I mean, that's not the Bible. Does that correspond with the Bible? Yes, it does. Uh, very much corresponds with the Bible. Now, the the fate of that. Um, or, and sold original, in, originally in sold couple, uh, what happened there? The science can't tell you, you know what happened, but the Bible says uh, here's why, you know, human beings, even though they had this immortal soul made in the image and likeness of God, here is why we're out there killing one another. We're mm -hmm. out there doing all these terrible lies and cheating and stealing, dark activities, and even you know worshiping the very demonic enemy of God himself, you know, um, some, this happens sometimes, uh, you know, why is this happening? Because someone first along the lines, and of course, the Bible is saying our first parents were the ones that got the whole thing started by saying, I'd rather be God myself mm. than be subservient to one. And of course, you can be sure that, oh, by the way, there's no question in my mind that the evil spirit exists, that Satan exists. And I think there's a ton of evidence for that. That's in another book of mine called <laughs> Christ versus Satan. But the main thing right now is, you know, I'm absolutely convinced the moment God ensouled our first um, uh, ensouled ancestors, let's call them ensouled Adam and Eve, the moment he did that, right at their elbow was the evil spirit. I think the serpent image in Genesis mm -hmm. is almost 
factual. And I'm sure if that uh, uh, were the case, that, that biblical image is pretty good. It's pretty solid. You know, what would he tempt him with? Don't you want to be like God yourself? Well, the tragedy yeah. is we were made in the image of God already. Mm-hmm. But it was we wanted to be equal to better than mm-hmm. the boss. You know, it's yeah. the ultimate sin of pride, right? Absolutely. And it's the reason the angels fell. Because Absolutely. they, I will not serve, non servium. Non servium, exactly. Yeah. What a tragedy, Father. And here we are. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> you know, a thousand years later. So... Seven Weeks Coffee is delicious gourmet coffee that can be shipped directly to your home. If you go to sevenweekscoffee.com, you'll learn the story of not only an amazing company that supports your pro-life values, but a company that creates and crafts some of the best and most gourmet coffee blends. I love drinking Seven Weeks Coffee because I'm not only getting an amazing cup of coffee, but I am supporting the pro-life movement every time I take a sip of Seven Weeks. Why is that? That's because as you guys may have heard already on the show, I've talked about it before, Seven Weeks Coffee gives 10% of their revenue, not just their profits, 10% of all revenue directly to Pregnancy Resource Center. So when you drink that great cup of coffee, you are directly supporting the care for mothers and babies in need. Seven Weeks Coffee is called Seven Weeks because that is when the baby at seven weeks pre-born is the size of, yes, a coffee bean. Check out Seven Weeks Coffee today. You can use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. If you haven't already tried it, what are you waiting for? That's sevenweekscoffee.com. Use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. We're going to get to the existing God. One more question, the dinosaurs. This is very uh, controversial among some in the evangelical space and and some in the Catholic space. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was some recent podcasting done by some friends of mine on on dinosaurs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Did the dinosaurs, did the ensouled human being come after the dinosaurs? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we were, and you think that's part of God's providence so that we wouldn't be all demolished by them? Yeah, uh, I, I basically think that the dinosaurs, um, you know, were there. It's part of the evolutionary process, and there's very good reasons why they developed as they did. Uh, this, of course, would be millions of years ago. We're uh, kind of in the hundreds of thousands of years ago, human beings, so we're not quite in the same category there. Uh, but uh, the dinosaurs do come way before uh, human beings do. But uh, we think that it's, you know, uh, uh, probably about, uh, uh, well, it's hard to say exactly when it's asteroid hit the earth but it seems like there was a cataclysmic asteroid Mm. very large asteroid that did hit the earth uh, just prior to uh, the um, uh, the disappearance of the dinosaurs it did um, alter uh, the climate uh, across the whole planet and when it did so wet places became dry places hot places became cold places uh, you know there definitely was huge um, uh, uh, um, atmospheric uh, changes and of course the dinosaurs eventually disappeared but it paved the way for much more um, sophisticated mammalian species uh, to mm-hmm. develop in relative peace from these gargantuan creatures that were kind of <laughs> crushing everything and my uh, way. my sons have a we have some dinosaur books that we read <laughs> about them in size comparison to a tiger or a lion and the Tyrannosaurus rex can, you know, savage. If if humans existed at the time of these animals, uh, we would make, we would not be here, you know, is is the idea. Okay. And then, and then another part of the account in the Old Testament, the flood. Yeah. And, Mm -hmm. you know, is this an allegory? Was there a flood? Uh, There was a flood. Did it, uh, was it to, let's try to clean do a clean slate here because people yeah. have gotten so demonic. What was going on well, with the flood? Well, first, you know, from the biblical point of view, uh, the flood is um, um, God's, uh, you know, wanting to start over. And uh, that might well have been the reason for the flood. But from a naturalistic and a, a geophysical point of view, uh, there was a, a flood. Um, the flood. What year was this roughly? Probably about 6,000 uh, years ago. So probably in the neighborhood of 4,000 to 5,000 BC. So there had <clears> theoretically <throat> been 55,000 years of ensouled human beings on the earth mm-hmm. before the flood, yeah. according to our best, some of our best guesses of yeah. science. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, the flood was certainly in uh, that Mesopotamian region, uh, and it certainly would have included what today we call the Holy Land. It would certainly have included Iran, Iraq, and so forth. Um, It would have been a huge uh, catastrophic flood. And uh, the fact is, is we can see it, you know, in the layering 
you know, what I was calling stratigraphy earlier, you can see it in the layering of the earth. That's somewhere in that neighborhood, um, maybe about 4,000 BC, uh, somewhere in there, maybe 5,000 BC. You can see the layering there uh, pretty clearly. Now, did this etch its way into the mind of human beings? It's in every single epic, ancient epic that we have Cro- across the world, across the board. So, well, was it? A, of, but yeah. was it a regional flood? You're saying just in Mesopotamia, or was I, it a world, a global it, flood? Well, it it looks like it was a regional one, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, the the evidence certainly suggests that from a geophysical point of view, but certainly it was a huge region uh, occupying a considerable part of the Middle East. So um, when you look at that, I mean, how did it get into Atra Hasis? How did it get into Gilgamesh? How did it get to mm-hmm. Enuma Elish? I mean, these are all myths are coming from different uh, you know, parts. And what do they all have in comma, common? A flood, a catastrophic flood that wiped out everything. So <clears throat> I think there's very good evidence for it. I think, um, you know, the biblical interpretation, I mean, obviously, if you read the Atra Hasis or Enuma Elish, you know, you're going to get a very different viewpoint, right? Of, uh, of, or even Gilgamesh. Why, why did the flood happen? Well, there's this dispute between the gods and, of course, in Atra Hasis, you know, well, the human beings were too noisy and too, you know, <laughs> You know, um, uh, difficult to contend with. So the gods got sick and tired of them and wiped them out. Now, the biblical author, of course, he's giving sacred truths necessary for salvation. The biblical author, no, that's not the reason. God wasn't sick and tired of our na- noisiness. He knew very well that we would be noisy when he created us. So what is the whole point? The point is we became evil. And here's the fundamental difference between the Bible and the the rival myths, the idea of moral evil, that is to say, an evil uh, principle, and of course, our moral cooperation with something that's evil, that basically becomes dark, it becomes destructive, not only of um, the people around us, it is destructive of ourselves, and it's destructive of our transcendent spiritual lives, and it separates us from God. That's the Bible. That's not in any rival epic. Mm-hmm. Now, when you get to that point, you have to say, wow, how could the biblical author know this? Only inspiration. I'm telling you, if you look at the whole Middle East, there's only one group of revealed scriptures that has anything like that. Our Old Testament. Everything else is basically the same thing. The, the gods got sick and tired of dealing with human beings. They were either dumb or noisy or, you know, you know, rapscallious or whatever it was. They didn't like it, and they just got rid of human beings. It was, you know, a, mm-hmm. a, a split decision kind of a deal, and um, uh, the gods were irritated. Is, is there evidence of a particularly depraved population at that time in the Mesopotamia area? I ask this because, you know, looking at parts of the world today and even the United States, you know, our abortion rate, you know, yeah. is so sky high. Looking at, you know, the Holocaust, you know, mm-hmm. in mid 20th century in Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union mm-hmm. and, and the, the mass amounts of uh, destruction that it wrought. I mean, we see lots of evils. Mm-hmm. Um, this is just in the last century. Lots mm-hmm. of evils perpetuated by modern man post flood theoretically here. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like this idea that God sent a flood potentially to kind of do a clean slate move how bad were they well um, compared to, <laughs> to us you could today it, uh, in conjunction mm-hmm. with abortion uh, because I have to tell mm-hmm. you uh, one of the things that is so pernicious according to the Old Testament right that just can't be tolerated is human sacrifice mm-hmm. particularly infanticide you know feeding your your baby child to you know this God you know Moloch you know uh, through the mouth of Moloch into a fire in order to get something that you need. And this is an actually documented thing that this was done. Oh, this is going... This kind of human sacrifice, yeah. Oh, yeah, human and infanticide, mm-hmm. uh, you know, infant sacrifice is going on all over the place. And, of course, you can see in the Bible, it is roundly condemned again and again and again uh, by Moses, who basically, you know, says, if you guys do anything like this, you know, anathema, sit, right? Uh, you're, you're, there's... 
there's uh, uh, no room for you in the kingdom of, of God. So the idea is pretty clear. And again, we see in the Jewish scriptures there in the Old Testament scriptures, we can see that there's already this break with the rest of the Middle Eastern culture, break with the religious ambiance uh, in the environment, and suddenly this strong condemnation. Now, people say, well, wait, in the book of Judges, this guy uh, comes out of his tent and he says, uh, uh, you know, hey, the Lord, you know, if you give me victory over this uh, uh, group of people, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a human sacrifice of whoever walks through my tent first. And of course, uh, he said, well, you mean he was a judge of Israel? Mm-hmm. Yes, he was. And he, did he make that promise? Yes, he did. And who comes through the tent? His daughter, his one and only daughter. And so the moral of the story is, mm. if you take on these pagan customs, which have been explicitly condemned in Torah, well, mm. you can expect that you will lose the most precious thing you have in your entire life. And you, if you do this ridiculous activity, you're going to get the ridiculous and horrible result. And the, the moral of the lesson is, don't look at mm. how the pagans are doing things. You have the law you follow it. <clears throat> but are we more moral today than those pre the flood? There, well, let's put it this way. There is a significantly more moral group of people. And is that because of the the Christianity and Judeo, the Judeo-Christian Ju Judaism? Yes, and it's exactly that. So that and and on a timeline, was Judaism really came after the flood? Was Judaism oh, yeah, practiced? So, so you have Judaism. How many years after the flood? Uh, well, I mean, basically, our patriarchs like Abraham was one thousand eight hundred um, BC. Uh, Moses, where you get the re that's the covenant at Mount Sinai. That's the ex. Exodus, that's the moment of the Jewish people. Now, the patriarchs are the ancestors of the Jewish people, but the Jewish people, per se, are in 1200 uh, BC when Moses is on Mount Sinai and, um, you know, gets the covenant from God after the Exodus. So that's 1200 BC. Uh, BC. Well, if the if the flood is between 4,000 and 5,000 BC, uh, 1,200 BC is uh, considerably, and of course, the, even the patriarchs eight, of Abraham's 1,800 BC, then you can pretty much. So somehow it. Noah had the law of God written on his heart, as we all do, and uh -huh. he was, you know, again, part of this story, how much of it is allegorical, how much of it is, you uh -huh. know, uh, exactly, um, you know, yeah. a, literal as it's, as it's written, but the uh -huh. idea is there were some and sold, you know, there are some human yeah. beings that were in their hearts upright before God, many who were not practicing infant sacrifice, you know, paganism, mm -hmm. like in horrific ways, a lot of destruction, yeah. destructiveness. And then God allowed, permitted, did he send it? Did he permit it? Either way, a mm -hmm. flood happened. There was a bit of a clean slate. And then in a few thousand years later, you have the introduction of Judaism. That is correct. And um, basically, as Judaism grows, this group of what I'm going to call, um, you know, moral people who have not only, um, you know, received the, the revelation of Moses, but decided to live according to the revelation of Moses. And then an even larger group after Jesus, who not only received the revelation and the church of Jesus, but lived according to the revelation uh, of Jesus and one to follow him, that group has been getting larger and larger and larger. Now you say, well, today, uh, you know, we could see that there are a lot of people out there who certainly seem to be um, diverging uh, from, uh, you know, that uh, that group of people. Uh, I mean, didn't you just say that 42% uh, of our young people will leave the church unless they mm -hmm. get some uh, evidence um, of God and uh, Jesus from science? And I said, yes, that's, that, that's true. Uh, but there is evidence, uh, really, uh, you know, truly excellent evidence for God, for Jesus, for an afterlife, from contemporary science. And that melds very well with Christianity. And, and of course, if you put it together. If we give our young people that evidence, we give them a fighting chance to belong and to decide to follow, um, you know, the teaching of Jesus without any fear that somehow they have to break with science or they have to break with uh, what they consider to be firmly established mm -hmm. rational evidence, right? Now they can see not only that, that faith and science are not contradictory, faith and science are complementary. They're mutually corroborative. And 
that, if we can get the word out and do that, uh, we are going to have, I think, a very strong group of people going forward. So people always say, do you think we're in the end times? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> let's uh, make sure that we do everything we can to keep our young people, uh, you know, believing not only in God, but believing in Jesus and the church. Let's get that higher level moral order <laughs> of people as big and as strong as we can through the complementarity of faith and science. And, of course, from teaching them, you know, the, the real uh, s- significance of, of religion and Jesus' moral teaching for both emotional health and physical health and marital health and relationships health and above all spiritual health it's certainly the end times in terms we're all going to die yeah. <laughs> some well, sooner true. than others and we don't know when exactly but it's yeah. our individual end time and that's yeah. really the big the big thing that matters what are we going to do with the life we have and what happens after our death okay yeah. so you just mentioned the truth about god's existence and the existence of christ who you know who christ says he is uh you know we obviously we need to have you back father spitzer because this is there's so much stuff here and i spent a lot of time on the dinosaurs and the flood but all right (laughs) and i have a ton more questions on that but we're gonna go to existence of god everylife.com is america's pro-life diaper company these are high performing diapers and wipes for your little one i think you're going to love the product they are great diapers we've ordered a lot of diapers at our house and every life does not disappoint what's so wonderful about everylife.com is you're not only getting a great diaper and wipes and they have other products that are coming so check it out but that everylife.com is a pro-life diaper company they support your values and they donate some of their proceeds back to the pro-life movement, including groups like your favorite, Live Action. So check out everylife.com today. You can use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. Order that bundle of wipes and diapers for that new little niece or nephew in your life, your new son or daughter, your friend's baby. It's a great gift. They also have these cute new mom baby boxes. Check it out at everylife.com and use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. All right. What is the best evidence for the unbeliever or the skeptic on the existence of God? All right. Well, you can break it down into four areas. Uh, one area uh, today, and, and by the way, uh, again, if I could just talk about my book, Science at the Please Doorstep do. to God. <laughs> if you get that book, Science at the Doorstep to God, Ignatius Press, just take a look at it and just read through um, the evidence. Number one, those near-death experiences. Uh, we have a lot of medical studies of near-death experiences where mm-hmm. um, you know, we can see that people's consciousness lives on after their physical body uh, is what we call clinically dead. Their now, consciousness lives on after their physical body is clinically dead. Yes. Does Does this mean the consciousness is not tied necessarily to the brain? That is correct. And that is so prolific now. The New York Academy of Sciences last Mm -hmm. year in 2022 actually came out with a statement in their proceedings uh, where they basically said there is a very credible possibility that your consciousness will survive your bodily death based solely on peer-reviewed medical Um, uh, studies of near-death experiences, terminal lucidity, and intelligence in hydrocephalic patients. It's been overwhelming now. Not only that, but there's actually an afterlife that is uh, reported too, not just you know, uh, like uh, we have a blind kid, uh, Bradley Burroughs, he's 16 years old, right? And um, by the way, 81% of blind people see for the first time when they're clinically dead. So they're sitting there on the operating table, flat EEG that means no electrical activity in the brain, fixed and dilated pupils, no gag reflexes, and suddenly for the first time, 81% of blind people start seeing. Wow. Hmm. Consciousness can't be located in the physical body because there was, uh, of course, their eyes were in some sense defective and uh, they couldn't see. And believe me, I know what blindness is all about. So the main thing is, okay, what do we uh, do here with Bradley Burroughs? He's 16 years old. He's been blind from birth. He suddenly, he has a heart attack. He He's, you know, zooms outside of the hospital. He doesn't stay in the operating room. He goes right outside the hospital and he's elevated right at the top of the hospital. 
little uh, outside looking down, and he says, you know, I saw snow for the first time in my life, and then I saw these uh, um, uh, tracks that were grooved into the snow. I knew they had to be uh, tram tracks because, of course, they're, they, they're so parallel. So I said, oh, wow, you know, train tracks in the snow. And then, of course, he said, I saw a grove of trees in the distance there. And then suddenly a tram came by. Could and that have tr- just been his imagination, though? Impossible. From what people have because, told him about what those things look like. Yes, but— I'm playing the skeptic here. Yeah, sure. First. But, yeah. I mean, how could you report, though, oh, on the back of that train there's a sign with an arrow pointing to the right and that the train went right down uh, the, this corridor where the tracks were and went into the grove of trees uh, that was in the distance. So he saw the actual train outside the Yes, hospital. and trains have schedules. Not his physical eyes, his yeah. soul. Yeah, his soul. The, it, not his physical eyes, his soul. Because he doesn't have even a physical wow. image in his brain, a visual image in his brain that he could hallucinate. But he saw all of this. He described the train, the tram perfectly, the sign on the back of the tram, what the tram did, that it went to the right into the grove of trees, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. How could you possibly uh, recount that flawlessly if you hadn't seen it? But of course, this wasn't in the operating room where his physical body was. It was outside the hospital, up and above the hospital. Hospital. So, and by the way, mm-hmm. we have really, literally thousands of these uh, validated cases that we mm-hmm. call veridical data for it. It's so prolific. The New York Academy of Scientists, um, uh, of Sciences, excuse me, uh, basically said, yeah, there's a very credible, credible possibility that uh, your, your consciousness will survive your bodily death. So that's one set of studies. Uh, I present it in chapters four and five of my book, mm-hmm. um, Science of Dark Side. Then there's a whole bunch of studies that are based on uh, new physical evidence. Uh, you know, when I debated Stephen Hawking and Leonard Mladenov and, mm. and Deepak Chopra on the Larry King show in 2010, Stephen Hawking was pretty much at the point of not really believing in God. I would say right in that area of agnostic to atheist, uh, at least on the show. In 2018, he switched completely. In 2018, he writes mm-hmm. an article for the Journal of High Energy Physics, his last article that he wrote called A Smooth Exit from Eternal Inflation. <laughs> Just emphasize the eternal there. The main thing there is he's been looking at LISA and LIGO, right, the two gravitational wave detectors that are out there uh, with his partner, Thomas Hertog. And essentially what they determined is that our universe could never have a uh, um, um, you know, uh, arisen, you know, never uh, could have originated from what we call a multiverse, um, an infinite multiverse with eternal inflation. So, Hawking, okay, explain what that means for those listening. <laughs> uh, an infinite multiverse. With eternal inflation. With eternal f- inflation. We're not talking about yeah. crypto right now. What are we? <laughs> okay, break well, it down briefly for sure, us here. Sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, the multiverse is like a mega universe. And that mm-hmm. mega universe is kind of coughing out all kinds of little bubble universes. Trillions upon trillions upon trillions of these bubble universes, one of which is our own. Now, of course, this was a, a theory that was... And the Big Bang originated the, the whole shebang. No, no. The Big Bang would have only originated it. our little bubble. Oh, excuse me. Within the... Okay. So the, the multiverse the, originates with... Well, the multiverse, it, it could have gone back eternally in time. Oh, I see, I see. Hence, eternal inflation. So mm-hmm. that was a thought. But all of a sudden, it became untenable scientifically that you could have an eternal multiverse powered by eternal inflation. There's a whole lot of reasons for this, but it, they're elucidated by Hawking and Hertog in this... Um, the seminal article. Now, what uh, the main thing uh, to remember uh, there is is that uh, if Hawking and Hertog are correct, and other physicists too uh, that are joining in there, and if you know, a variety of other reasons, too, are correct, then no multiverse could be eternal. In other words, as Hawking says, even, you know, a multiverse would have to have a beginning. It could not have originated from an eternally inflating condition for very good scientific reasons. Now, there's one thing we know about a beginning. If, let's say, a multiverse has a beginning, or physical reality itself, whatever you configure it as, you know, higher dimensional space universe, if that had to have a beginning, and the evidence now shows, scientific, uh, scientific evidence now shows, that would have to have a beginning. If physical reality had a beginning, one thing is sure, prior to the beginning, Physical reality did not exist. Prior to the beginning, physical reality would have to be nothing. Now, there's one thing we know about nothing. It's nothing 
and it can only do nothing <laughs> because it's nothing. Now, if that's the case, then when uh, prior to the beginning, the when the when physical reality would have had to have been nothing. Physical reality itself could never have moved itself from nothing to something because the only thing it could do when it was nothing was nothing. Therefore, something else, something that transcends physical reality, something that transcends space-time asymmetry, physical space-time asymmetry, something completely transcendent with the creative power to create out of nothing, ex nihilo, would have had to have done it. Spirit. Uh, well, we could call it spirit. Mm -hmm. We could call it a creative power, which is a spiritual creative power, a transcendent creative power, but it ain't physical. That's for sure. It's not part of our universe. That's for sure. And it's probably, therefore, a transcendent or spiritual creative power power. That's exactly right. Sounds kind of like God to me. <laughs> and so this, uh, you know, all of a sudden we now, as I just said, why are most young scientists um, believers in God? They're reading. I mean, it's not just Stephen Hawking and Thomas Hurtog. It's now becoming a consensus point that the, you know, the, the, the likelihood, uh, you know, that the string theory landscape, the multiverse, et cetera, all of it's going to have to have a beginning. I've always found it so peculiar about atheism. I've never, uh, I've never been able to, in a way, wrap my mind around it because it seems like it takes more faith to be an atheist, <laughs> that everything could come from nothing, and but yeah. nothing can't be God or a spirit or a creative power. It has to be truly nothing. Yeah. It seems like that takes more faith and more irrationality, quite frankly, yeah. than any religion. Oh, yeah. If you if you can show actual evidence that you have to have a beginning of physical reality, then there's no question it would take a zillion times more faith to believe that something could just pop out of nothing, uh, right? Um, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, when the only thing nothing can do is nothing, uh, you know, then to believe that mm -hmm. certainly there's some transcendent spiritual creative power that did it. I mean, it, you, today, honestly, to try and get out of the evidence for a beginning, you have to do these backflips, which are really... Uh, <laughs> so how do we connect the evidence for a beginning to this God spirit thing, you know, and you said earlier, it's the majority of scientists and medical professionals who believe in, uh, they don't necessarily have to say God, but some sort of a divine power, creative power, I think was the term you used. Okay. What's the evidence that that God is, is the Trinity, oh, is oh, the oh, Trinity, oh, well, oh, is oh, the oh, creator. Yeah. Cer certainly would have to be the creator of this thing because something mm -hmm. has to come from, so everything has to come from something and this yeah. is this would be the something. Mm -hmm. So he is, they are, it is the creator. Yeah. Okay, the okay. Christian doctrine on the Trinity and we've got 10 minutes for this, live, <laughs> Father. All right, I'm going <laughs> to uh, respect, respect uh, your time and we want you back uh, in to do the, more of this. Uh, but uh, now we've got Father, Son, Holy Spirit uh, yeah. and the Son is Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago enters the world as a baby. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right on the marker. Okay. Well, no. first of all, you can't prove the Trinity scientifically, but you can prove a creative power scientifically. So there's a that's the first thing. And of course, um, uh, there, here's the the difficulty with the Trinity. You have to be very careful about how you're looking at the Trinity. But mm -hmm. I'll just put it this way: uh, in every uh, metaphysical proof for the existence of God, you know, you can only have one unrestricted entity, right? Only one infinite entity. Why is that? And by the way, this goes all the way back to Plato and Aristotle. They knew just as much as we do in our post-scientific age, right? We know, um, you know, very clearly you can only have one in infinity. Uh, think about it. Let's suppose you had infinity number one and infinity number two. Well, there'd have to be a difference between infinity one and mm -hmm. infinity two. Now, of course, um, mm -hmm. uh, you c if you said there were no difference mm -hmm. between infinity one and infinity two, there's absolutely no difference between them, they'd be the self-same entity. Mm -hmm. And if they were the self-same entity, they'd be one and only one. So if you're going to have two, you have to have a difference between them. Now think about this. It's just the old platonic argument, right? Uh, if, if Let's suppose then that one infinity has something or is something or is somewhere or is in another dimension that the other one was not. <laughs> Get it? 
So, of course, the other one's not uh, in this dimension. It's not uh, in this uh, particular place. It doesn't have this thing. Obviously, it's finite Mm -hmm. in as much as it does not have an activity, a power, a dimension that the other one does. It's finite. And that means that that second infinity would always have to be a finite infinity. But a finite infinity is a contradiction, which is a really bad no-no. So is this so, evidence for the oneness of God? Yes. So God, you, you can only have one infinite power. So let's, that's the first, when we talk about the Trinity, the first thing we have to say is, how many infinite powers do you have? One and only one, and that can be proven. So we have one Godhead, infinite uh, Godhead is what we call it, one infinite nature. And there can only be one infinite nature. Now you say, well, how is it that you have three persons? Okay, well, let's take this bottle. I'm, oh, I'm going to talk about the, pro- the <laughs> what's called self-consciousness. I'm aware of this bottle. But I'm also aware of being aware of the bottle. And not only that, I'm aware of my being aware of my awareness of the bottle. If you see what I'm saying, I can do a triple. I can, can you do a quadruple? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Uh, it may be possible. I don't know if I can do it, but I know I do the triple. I know mm-hmm. I'm aware of being aware um, of myself. So <clears throat> in that um, sense... I get my own universe. You get your own universe. But think about that for just a moment. That has to be a genuinely spiritual power. We're talking about us getting ourselves, getting ourselves. Now, just think about a dog, and the dog is chasing its tail. And, of course, it's not just that the dog catches its tail. The dog is literally swallowing itself, swallowing itself. Now, you can't do that except by traveling at an infinite velocity. Mm. And if you travel at an infinite velocity, you're transcending every physical, every possible physical process, every possible physical structure. So there's no question we have some spiritual capacity in us that's demonstrable just by our own self-consciousness, our self-awareness. Now, let's take that notion of self-awareness, this actual power to get ourselves getting ourselves so that we can, as it were, be in two uh, different um, relative positions with respect to ourselves at the same time, or three relative positions with respect to ourselves at the same time, inside ourselves, inside ourselves, that we have this capacity to do this. If that's the case, and we really just analogize a person of the Trinity to like a self-consciousness, like, um, you know, a a self-conscious power. So, um, what the the revelation um, of, uh, in in the New Testament, the revelation of Jesus uh, basically says that, you know, Of course, you can only have one infinite power, but you can have three self-consciousnesses making an an unconditional use of that one infinite power. Wow. So just think of your computer. I like this better than the clover. And St. Patrick's clover. <laughs> it's a little bit better, more elucidating, for sure. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but anyway, so uh, the the long and the short of it is, yeah. So you your one um, your three self consciousnesses um, uh, are making uh, an unconditional use of that one infinite power. And since it's an infinite power, um, why not have three um, self consciousnesses making um, uh, an unconditional use? It's not like you have. Have three terminals that are plugged into the same central processing unit in a computer. Of course, you know, the more you plug in, the more it diminishes the capacity of the CPU. But on the other hand, that's not the case with an infinite power. It can mm-hmm. supply anything. Now you say, well, okay, um, what did Jesus say um, that these three self-consciousnesses who are making use of this one infinite power, this one infinite intellect, this one infinite intelligence, as it were, uh, what are they doing um, <clears throat> You know, relative to each other. They're in love. So we say 
that then um, the first self-consciousness that we call the uh, Jesus called the Father, that self-consciousness loves the Son. The Son um, is the beloved, and that's what Jesus calls himself, ha agapetas, the beloved one. In fact, it's so astounding um, that John, uh, you know, uh, the beloved disciple, names himself beloved because Jesus named himself beloved of the Father. So we can just say, Okay, the Father then loves the Beloved One, the, the second self-consciousness, and then the second self-consciousness loves the Father back. So the Father is a loved who is then beloved. The Son, the second self-consciousness, is the Beloved One who now is a lover, so the Beloved hyphen lover. Then you have the Holy Spirit. What's that about? Well, just like children, right? Children um, are, um, uh, you know, um, uh, loved by the father and the mother. So uh, let's analogize it now to the Holy Trinity. So the father and the son together in their unity love the spirit. And the spirit like a child, receives the love from both of them and gives back the love to both of them in their unity. So now we have, as it were, a completeness of um, a lover and beloved and the beloved of the lover and the beloved. So that's why Thomas Aquinas says, okay, in God you have one nature. You have three persons, and you have four processions. So the lover loves the beloved. The beloved receives the love from the lover and gives it back to the lover. Then the lover and the beloved in their loving union give themselves to the Holy Spirit. That's the third procession. The fourth is the Holy Spirit receives the love of the lover and the beloved, and he reflects it back like um, a child who reflects the love of the unity of the mom and dad back to them. Now, um, that's what we call four processions. Now, of course, you're going to say, well, what about the number two? We have one guy, we have three persons, we have four processions. What about the number two? Well, uh, as um, the Christian church saw, um, this pertains to Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has two natures. So in other words, um, first of all, who becomes incarnate? Well, the infinite power of God doesn't enter into a finite body. That's a finite infinite. That's a contradiction. That can't happen. And the church from its very inception knew that that could never happen. So that's the first thing to notice. So when we're dealing with the Father, the, the um, uh, you know, the, the Trinity, I mean, uh, the, the incarnation, incarnation, we basically see that it's the second person, that second self consciousness who's making use of the one infinite power that second self-consciousness is what becomes incarnate that self-consciousness that inner universe enters into a finite physical body but he doesn't give up a being in his infinite uh, making use of his infinite power with the father and the spirit so he does both. Now you say, well, how can you analogize that? Well, like your dreams, right? Have you ever had this experience where your own self-consciousness, right? So, okay, here, our consciousness is here and we're in this material and um, I know that I'm talking to you, you're a real entity. But in my dreams, right, I can also have what I call dream world. And so in my dreams, my consciousness can enter into a dream, quote unquote, body. And of course, uh, I I can be flying around and I can be doing this and that. I could never do in my regular physical body, but I actually think it's me uh, because it's my self-consciousness that's in my dream body, uh, in my dream world. Now, uh, you say, well, okay, all right. So uh, now how, how could you... Um, you know, uh, have both your self-consciousness in dream world and your self-consciousness back in your body at the same time. It's at that one moment or maybe you're falling or something mm -hmm. from a mountain and you go, oh, this is a dream. 
Mm. Your self-consciousness right there is aware of the real world and the dream world and which one is which. Now, that's just an analogy. I'm not saying, but I'm trying to give you the thought. Yeah, a self-consciousness can do that. And so we can basically say Jesus Christ is one person one self-consciousness that is, um, um, you know, making use of an infinite nature and a finite nature at the same time. There's no contradiction in this. And that's uh, been uh, the teaching of the church. So you think of it as one God. That's one infinite power, one Godhead, one infinite nature. Two uh, <clears throat> natures uh, that are being used by the one self-consciousness, the second self-consciousness um, in the Trinity, the Son, and then three persons in the Trinity, right? We just, uh, the, the lover of the beloved, the beloved of the lover, and the beloved of the lover and the beloved, the, the Spirit. They are um, the Trinity, three persons in the Trinity, and fourth, four processions of love, um, in the persons of the Trinity. And there uh, pretty much is a summary of how you do that without, you know, making contradictions right and left. So it's not proper, though, to say that God has a physical body. No. God is spirit. Yeah. God but is it not is proper to say that the person of Jesus has human nature, mm -hmm which includes a body, but then why can't you say, well, then God would have a body? Well, because it's the second self, it's the second person. We say that the Son of God has a body. We don't say that the nature of God mm -hmm. has a body. So, right, if you said the nature of God or the power of God or the one infinite power of God uh, had a body, you would contradict yourself instantly because the one infinite power is infinite. And, you know, a body by definition is, is, is finite. So you don't want to make a finite infinite. So you can't say the one infinite power of God has a body. But you can say that the second self-consciousness, the second person of the Trinity, is incarnate, uh, just uh, you know, in, a, in a, a finite body, just like I can, I have my second self, my, my self-consciousness, excuse me, can be in my dream world a body. Okay, so last question for today. We have to have you back, Father. We should we should do this every week. <laughs> get, our, get our YouTube live going. Okay, last question. Uh, what and this could be hours, and you've written yeah. and spoken on this, but what is the evidence for Christ, Jesus Christ, being God? Okay, well, there's, um, boy, it's it's a huge amount of things. And, and again, uh, if you wouldn't mind just going to my book, um, uh, Science, Reason, and Faith, Discovering the Bible, uh, just go to uh, the section on what's the evidence for um, Jesus' divinity. I'm just going to break it down into five uh, points. Uh, number one, of course, is the resurrection of Jesus in glory and in power. And uh, we can talk about that at another time. And but, the historical record of that resurrection. Is, not only a historical, but a scientific record as well. And it's a very good record. And you can actually prove it from historical argument. Because, man, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, there's just no way you would have had a church. I mean, just t take a look at, uh, um, you know, there's uh, good arguments from N.T. Wright and John P. Meyer uh, on this, two of the best historical exegetes. But basically what Meyer and, and Wright are saying is simply this. The Christian church defied all other messianic movements, right? Mm. I mean, basically, you've got um, every, like, within 200 years, 100 years before Christ, 100 years after Christ, you have all these Messianic movements. The mess Messiah of that movement is killed. What happens? Mm -hmm. <laughs> With, uh, even the Messianic movement of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was, you know, there was a Messianic movement around him. The minute he dies, what happens? Within uh, like 30 years, uh, gone so. I mean, the whole movement is gone. Christianity, uh, the, the Messiah is humiliated, executed, et cetera, et cetera. And what do we have? We have basically uh, the, hum the Christian church within 240 years becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire, the very empire that was persecuting it. An exponential increase. The Messiah dies and you have an exponential increase going on generation after generation until the Christian church takes over the whole Roman empire. I kid you not. <clears throat> this is exactly what happens. 
Myron Wright say, okay, how are you going to do this if Jesus wasn't really risen from the dead, if he really didn't give us his Holy Spirit, and unless those apostles, those first generations of apostles, were doing miracles in the name of Jesus in front of everybody according to the Spirit that Jesus gave them? How, why would God the Father, why would God the Father uh, basically say, okay, I'm going to allow you guys to do these miracles, you're going to raise the dead, going to cure the blind, going to do all these things, and you're going to do it by in the name of Jesus, but Jesus really wasn't who he said he was. Jesus really wasn't risen as the Christian church said he was. Uh, Jesus uh, really uh, didn't tell us straight <clears throat> when he said that he was the exclusive son of the Father. He didn't sh uh, tell us straight when he claimed to have, <clears throat> to know the Father and to have the same power as the Father and to know the Father exactly as the Father knew him. All right, this, uh, that's just a way of saying, I'm divine. I'm just as divine as the Father. Jesus Christ didn't have, well, if Jesus didn't have it straight and the Christian church is lying about the resurrection, would you mind telling me why again and again and again and again, all of these apostles are out there in the first generations of the church doing so many miracles that is causing an exponential increase in the Christian community after the death and humiliation and execution of their Messiah? Are you kidding me? I mean, I think duh. that someone could be listening and say, well, Islam. Islam, you know, Christians don't believe that Muhammad was given an inspired book of the, you know, of the Quran. And yet there have been many, you know, Islam has proliferated. Yeah, but the, important. Oh. Yeah, give, give us the distinction why that mm -hmm why that proliferation of Islam doesn't prove the truth of Muhammad receiving the Quran from on high and being his prophet versus the proliferation of Christianity via miracles and, you know, the resurrection proves that the resurrection actually happened. Yeah, well, first, two important, I mean, as you said, yeah, there's a real difference. First thing is the Christian church was persecuted every single step of the way until the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. So, in other words, the Christian church exponentially in uh, increased amidst continuous persecution. Islam did not have it. was not militant is what you're saying. The it early was church not was militant. not militant. They were persecuted. They, they were, were killed. They were martyred. But early Islam was militant and was not persecuted. In fact, so well, you could make the case, uh, I might say they were the persecutors, uh, if I can put it that way. But, uh, you, know, um, we, you know, we have to, you know, uh, be generous in the way we characterize it. But nevertheless, uh, that, that's pretty much the case. Uh, the, the characterization. The second thing uh, that, that really is the case, too, is you look at what's intrinsic uh, to Christianity, namely the primacy of love. So um, this is very different from jihad as the central, uh, uh, you know, credo that uh, conversion through jihad is is the central thing. Well, you contrast that to love. Now, you know, you, you can say that militancy uh, um, is going to produce a lot of mm -hmm. uh, exponential increases because, of course, if you start conquering people right and left, you create an atmosphere of fear right and left, and you push everybody uh, into submission mm -hmm. or you know, you get jihaded, right, and so forth and so on. Um, you know, you get a fatwa on you. Um, uh, for all intents and purposes, that's one way of proliferating, right? But it ain't the Christian way of proliferating. The Christianity does not uh, talk about jihad. It does not talk about uh, conversion at all costs by producing, a you know, a, an atmosphere of fear. If you look at Jesus' teaching, it's very, very clear, right? Blessed are uh, what we call the poor in spirit, mm -hmm. the humble-hearted. Blessed are the meek the gentle hearted and this is not exactly a warrior uh, you know um, you know uh, rah rah militancy speech I mean this is just the opposite what did the Romans say about what Christianity was doing to the Roman Empire these guys are so meek and humble and uh, you know they're they're so forgiving and compassionate that they're making us weak we're becoming less of warriors right mm -hmm. and of course Augustine has to say hey wait a minute it's a different kind of strength but it's mm -hmm. not the strength that uh, can do this by militancy, mm -hmm. by power, by um, threats, by fear, etc. No, Christianity's conversion is through love. Mm -hmm. And the necessity of the miracles uh, in order to make that message of love endurable, because you knew a huge chunk of your population, and that would include you if you're part of that Christian population, would 
be persecuted, wow. not just in the Colosseum, but in a million other mm-hmm. ways you would be persecuted. And by the way, the early Christians, they not only lost their lives. I mean, prior to that, they lost their social status, their financial status, right? I mean, they were just truly uh, ripped away from just about everything. And yet, why? Why would they have allowed this to happen? Why would they have done? Because they were utterly convinced uh, um, that Christ was risen from the dead. They were utterly convinced that the spirit of Christ working in the name of Jesus was performing miracles right and left. They were utterly convinced that the, that the works of the Christian church, namely, uh, you know, the Christian church became the largest by far healthcare organization, the largest mm-hmm. by far educational institution, the largest by far public wef- welfare institution, and still is to this day. If you look at the Catholic Church, oversees 26% of the healthcare in the, in the world. Wow. You look at uh, the Catholic Church, still 98,000 elementary schools of 46,000 uh, 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 secondary schools overseen, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of orphanages, tens of thousands of public uh, welfare distribution uh, centers, tens of thousands of, of uh, uh, treatment for uh, marriages and, and widows and so forth and so on. You look just around the globe. I mean, I, I mean, Jesus' word, the, 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 the idea of proliferating love and, and proliferating um, this in the way that Jesus did it, don't worry, he'd take care of it, even though it's counter to every logic of the world that says, use fear, use power, use militancy, that's the way you're going to get an expansion. Jesus said, nope, you trust me, you trust my um, Holy Spirit, you trust the miracles, you trust the name of Jesus, you teach, you trust my teaching, and you'll proliferate by doing my will, and you will proliferate the right way toward a world of peace, toward a world of, of genuine concern and compassion, even for the weakest mm-hmm. people. And of course, finally, at the end of the day, right, whatsoever you do to these least ones of mine, mm-hmm. you do to me. So, you know, our objective then is to see Jesus Christ in the weakest in the world, because as Paul says, when I grow weaker, Christ grows stronger <laughs> in me. Amen. My weakness is my strength. Beautiful. I think I stopped you at number two. <laughs> you had, did you have three more uh, proofs for why Jesus, you, you were referencing your book, Father? Uh, absolutely. Of course. The uh, if you've got a few more minutes, you want to rattle them off for us. This is such just, awesome. This is so wonderful to yeah. hear. So, uh, Number one, of course, is the evidence for the resurrection, the evidence yes. of the early church's uh, miracles through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. The third thing is, is actually the preaching of Jesus himself. Mm. And, uh, you know, that, that one great, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of seminal statement that he makes to his disciples: "Full power and authority has been given over to me, uh, you know, by my Father." And then he goes on to say, "And no one knows um, the the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him." What's Jesus saying there? I know the Father as the Father knows me. Mm. That word "know" just doesn't mean conceptual; it literally means that they they know each other inside out as it were, in their very being, in their very hearts. He is equivalent to the Father. That's what he's saying. He's declaring himself to be divine. And there are many other reasons uh, uh, for believing this. But, you know, I'm just going to throw out the Shroud of Turin here because Mm. there's a huge amount of evidence for the resurrection on the Shroud of Turin, the particle radiation theory, but that is for another day. But if you know the, the details behind that particle radiation theory, you will not have a single scintilla of a doubt of Jesus's rising from the dead. Uh, remember, the 1988 carbon dating mm-hmm. has been completely debunked, and so the Shroud of Turin right now, uh, there's just immense amounts of evidence of its authenticity and the description of the crucifixion uh, you know, through the blood and, and the imaging mm-hmm. on the Shroud is so accurately and uncannily predictive of everything that the Gospel accounts say. It just, um, I have not, not a single doubt mm-hmm. that this thing uh, is, this, um, uh, rel- is a relic not only of Jesus' crucifixion, that it really was his burial shroud, but of his resurrection too. Literally, the particles that constituted his body in a gigantic flux of neutrons and proton deuteron flux, uh, that they actually constituted the image that's emblazoned on the shroud. And there's very good scientific proof 
or it, which I can describe in another episode. So I do think that's another way in which science, uh, you know, comes into the fore. There are a variety of other things. We call them historical critical method. Uh, we can see not only that Jesus during his ministry, he didn't just have what we call the prophetic power of performing miracles. Jesus performed miracles like raising the dead by his own authority. In other words, when Jesus uh, gets there, right, uh, you know, to uh, the scene, let's say the widow of Nain, and he sees uh, the boy, he's dead, coming out on the bier, and the widow is weeping and so forth. Jesus doesn't uh, then make an appeal to God and, and say, you know, Lord, can you help me uh, to, to do this? I, I want to be your instrument, your mediator. And, uh, no, Jesus says, young man. I say to you, arise. Mm -hmm. And he uses the emphatic ego. In Greek, you don't have to say ego, lego. And, you know, I say. All you need is lego. It's, mm -hmm. con it's conjugated. So if you use the ego with it, you're pointing attention to yourself. I say to you, by my own power and authority, arise. Now, you can just imagine what these, these Jewish people are thinking. Wow. Only God has power over life and death. This guy's going around doing, the, you know, raising the dead by his own power. He must have the power of God within him. This is already being, you know, bantied about. Oh, do you do not think for a moment that the Pharisees don't recognize mm. that Jesus, by this very action, right? How does he uh, uh, raise the the, um, the little girl, um, you know, the, mm. the daughter of J Jairus? Same thing. Little girl. I say to you, right, Talitha Kaum, I say to you, arise. I say, me, by my own power within me. That's just the beginning of it. Of course, Jesus claims to have the power to forgive sins, which, of course, the Pharisees immediately see as a blasphemy, et cetera, et cetera. But this goes on and on and on and on, and it would take me a lot of time to give you the full uh, list of evidence, but there's tremendous power, uh, tremendous evidence uh, from a scientific and historical vantage point of Jesus' resurrection, and of course, of his miracles by his own power, of his disciples' mm -hmm. miracles in his own name. You start putting together the whole gamut of things, including uh, and around his preaching, you get a pretty good picture. He really is the Son of God. Incredible, incredible. And those listening, let us know if you want to hear more about the science behind the Shroud of Turin. And I know you have a lot to say about Eucharistic miracles I to know. Father Spitzer. <laughs> so we will have to get into that in the future. But wow, this has been awesome. And your books, you know, I highly recommend. We will link your website so people can explore them more. These are no mere mere books. These are tomes. <laughs> No, you're, you're, you, you're, you've given us some cliff notes, which I really appreciate for the YouTube world. I know a lot of our listeners, though, are readers and are going to love to explore those books. So, Father, where can people find your work? Uh, well, of course, uh, you can go to our own website at modgetcenter.com. <laughs> we do have a little bookstore there. Of course, you can go to um, uh, um, ignatius.com uh, uh, for the science at the doorstep to God. You can go to osv.com, osvpress.com. Uh, uh, as well for the science, reason, and faith, discovering the Bible as putting together the scripture and, and faith and science. And um, also, um, you can go to Amazon <laughs> or any of the, uh, the usual um, online uh, uh, distributors and, uh, and realtors. Well, this has been absolutely delightful. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Will you come back? Can we of can course. we have you back? I know you're not too far from here, so hopefully it wasn't too much of a trek, but what <laughs> no. a wonderful episode, and thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us about the existence of God and the incarnation. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Let me know what you think. I, I think I, there's so much fascinating stuff and so much more to unpack from what Father Spitzer was saying about the account in Genesis and how it does not contradict science, the existence of God, the incarnation, so much good stuff. Let me know if you want what questions you have for Father Spitzer. We're going to have him back in studio and we're going to tackle some more stuff. I'm especially interested in the, the history behind the science behind the resurrection and Eucharistic miracles. That was actually big in 
in my faith story of becoming Catholic. So Mm -hmm. that's for another day. But don't forget to subscribe to the Lila Rose podcast if you haven't already. If you're watching on YouTube, ring that notification bell so you hear about episodes immediately. And if you're listening on your Apple or podcast, Apple podcast or Spotify, don't forget to leave us a review that helps the podcast reach more people. Last thing, of course, check out Father Spitzer's work. Also check out our new Locals community. We are now on Locals. You can join us there. You can support the podcast there, become a patron, get special access to our community that we're building. I'm super excited. This is going to be a transition from Patreon. So our patrons, you're going to get special access to. I'll let you know about that more through Patreon. But check out the Locals community today. The link is in the bio and we will see you next time.